the relationship that I had with football for the, like the next five years where I hated the game, didn't want to talk about it. I, I hardly watched football. Um, yeah, I just didn't want anything to do with it because I was trying to find myself beyond the game. One. Such a great conversation with Ryan Mundy. He's an eight-year NFL veteran. He won the Super Bowl in 2009 and tells us what that was like. He's turned entrepreneur. So he's a founder of Alchemy Health, which aims to be the universal health platform for the Black community. Tells us about what inspired him to do so, what he would say to folks that are entering their mental health journey, how he trains and operates at peak performance, and just what a pleasure to get to know him better. Enjoy Ryan, guys. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good. I think I have afternoon. Are you in Chicago? Yeah, I'm in Chicago. So we just crossed over. That's right. We're the same time zone. <laughs> Where are you based out of? We, we're in Austin, Texas, and okay. there is a whole winter storm warning. Yeah. It's, uh, it was single digits here in Chicago. So yeah, um, it could always be worse. Yeah, it could always be worse. So my brother went to U of M. I saw that you were there for a bit. Yeah. And he also lived in Chicago. So I know fully well how cold cold can get. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was in Ann Arbor for four years, uh, 03 to 07. Uh, mm. I everybody best time of my life. It's I cold. love the school spirit. It's yeah. great. All right, Ryan. I'd love to get started with asking you, what's one thing you're appreciative for today? Um. This very moment, right now, I'm appreciative of the now. Oh, that's beautiful. And being so grateful myself for sharing this space with you. One thing that I read on the website that I love was that each journey begins with a single step. So I'd love to take us back to your first steps and get to understand your background. Can you tell me a little bit about growing up for you? Yeah, for sure. So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, which is by most accounts, a Midwest city and an East Coast state. Um, mm. And uh, I come from the inner city um, where I grew up riding bikes all day and staying mm. out to the street lights came on. Um, and really grew up with like a strong sense of like community uh, together and uh, ultimately to uh, self. And that, that'll be really important as we uh, move forward and, and talk about some other things. Um, but yeah, my, I had a great upbringing. I have two younger sisters. Uh, my parents have been married for 43 years. And one thing that I could always say about, uh, excuse me, my mom and dad is that they were always there. Like they were always there. They were always present. Uh, my dad was my coach uh, for a lot of times <laughs> when I uh, was an athlete or a youth athlete. And uh, he was there so much, I didn't want him there. I was like, man, can, like, you, can you go somewhere else? Can you do something? Give me some space. Yeah, it's just like, give me some space. Um, but through all that, uh, my parents have always been there. And so like, as far as I can look back, and, and it's important to how I got here now because I believe everything happens for a reason. I started playing football in 1992. Uh, I was the biggest kid on the team. I was the strongest kid on the team. And I was the fastest kid on the team. However, wow. uh, I was playing offensive guard blocking uh, for a terrible team that went winless the entire season. And mm. so here I am. I'm like, man, I'm bigger, stronger, faster. I'm not getting the football and we're losing something ain't adding up here. And so mm. I told my dad uh, that I didn't want to play uh, the following season. And so fast forward, the following season comes around. Uh, my dad doesn't sign me up. And the first few weeks go by. Uh, and uh, I guess he had had enough uh, because he ultimately uh, made me get back out on the football field. But there was one caveat. Uh, if I was going to get back out there, again, I knew I had talent. I knew I had ability. I needed the football because I wanted to score touchdowns. And so <laughs> um, that he, he agreed to that. Uh, and it wasn't that wasn't a hard sell because now his best friend was a coach. And, and so uh, I, I tell that story. Uh, because had my dad not made me get back out there, then I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, right. You know, that moment in time was, I think, a defining moment for me uh, that really set the trajectory of my life. And again, I believe everything happens for a reason, but I could 
see the day. I could see the like the the experience, the time where we were. Uh, and I look at that moment and say, that pretty much set up the rest of my life. Uh, so I'm very, very blessed and thankful for like the leadership of my father, the foresight there, and then again for them always being there. Because had it not been for them, then who knows what what would have happened. And it's all about also being in a spot to receive these moments and receive these nudges. In this case, you were also able and willing in a space to receive that from your dad. Yep. So then take that. How did that lead you to the NFL? Uh, so fast forward uh, throughout my youth career, uh, go to high school. I was high school All-American. I go to the University of Michigan, as we had talked about. Um, and uh, I spent four years at the University of Michigan. And uh, they were great seasons, uh, lifelong friends, et cetera. And then I had a graduate year that I spent at West Virginia. Um, and then mm. in 2008, I got drafted back to my hometown team, the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so, like, that career trajectory of, like, local hometown kid who at one point in time didn't want to play football, uh, then comes full circle uh, back around to be drafted by the hometown team. And so it was truly fulfilling for me. Because, again, I've always been supported by folks who have uh, championed me, supported me uh, in ways that I don't even know about. Um, and so like the, to have the opportunity to like live out a lifelong dream in front of everybody who had helped me get to that point was really incredible. Uh, but it got better because we actually won a Super Bowl that year. And so yes. not only did I get drafted back to my hometown team, we won a Super Bowl <laughs> my rookie season. So I was like, wow, this is easy. We should do this all the time. Uh, not so much, but uh, <laughs> and like, I've, I've just been very blessed and thankful uh, for like my, the set of my life experiences because it's not only always been about me, but every step of the way, like my family has been able to experience that. My mom and dad, my sisters have been to several Rose Bowls. They've been to super, multiple Super Bowls. You know, the list yeah. goes on and on and on. So uh, it's truly been a great ride so far. You mentioned the sense of community growing up being really strong. And as you're mentioning your experiences right now, the sense of community is still ringing true to me. So I'm hearing this as a really strong value of yours. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's something that, uh, again, I grew up with day one. Um, and now like in my day to day, uh, running alchemy, like I, I preach that to my team and our external partners all the time. Uh, one of our core standards or key characteristics is together. Um, mm. you know, oriented around team. Uh, we have like an extreme focus on partnerships. It's always about like uh, having the right people do the right things and, and, and aligning under like a shared mission or a vision to accomplish a goal. What about that is important to you? I think it's everything. Um, for me, realizing that uh, where my strengths lie, I'm really big on, and that's why I mentioned self, like yeah. self-awareness. What Like when am I uniquely qualified to do and what should I be doing? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I can do, but what should I be doing? And that's really how I'm yeah. trying to like drive my time and focus, particularly as CEO now. There's no yeah. shortage of things that need to get done, things that I need to answer, so on and so forth. But like being very, quite frankly, ruthless about like how I pr prioritize them and understand like what's the best and highest use of me. Uh, and then building the team around that and making sure that we have the gaps filled. Ryan, that's a really hard thing for folks to understand about themselves. And you also mentioned that you've always had this sense of self. How did you connect to it? Uh, you kind of have to uh, play in sports. Like you, you're immediately um, in tune or understand like your strengths and your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows up and it's constantly reinforced in football. It's reinforced every play. Right. So you're yeah. understanding like what you're good at, what you're not good at. How does that materialize into like the role and the job that you're in a position that you play? Uh, how does that how do like folks across the table look at you because of your strengths and, and weaknesses? You've got to understand all these things in order to go out there and do a job and uh, perform. And so like the understanding of self really showed up uh, more so on a physical standpoint, obviously, with football, uh, you know, understanding like speed, size, all those measurable. And there is some correlation to like a mental disposition, particularly with football and also playing defense. You have to actually go yeah. hit people. Uh, yeah. And that's a mindset in and of itself. Uh, but it is, you know, you always had that. It was constantly reinforced on like, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What I need to work on? So on and so forth. 
it's about being really brutally honest, setting the mirror yeah. in front of you and yeah. seeing what the strengths are that I can lean into, what the weaknesses are, what's worth working on versus not and yeah. pursuing that path. And it's great with sports too, is that you can watch it on tape. Like yeah. you can't, you, I don't know where you can watch your business meeting on tape or what. Like, <laughs> hey, we can record this. Yeah, you can record it. But like in sports, like you get, you can literally watch yourself and see that moment, yeah. uh, in which you made a good player of athlete. And to invest in oneself like that. Let's go back to football. So while you were playing football, what was that like for you? And I'm asking, so I'm from Sierra Leone in West Africa. I did not grow up in the U.S. and not as familiar. So how cool for me to get a sense from you of what playing in the NFL was like. I can't even describe it, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I tried and I've tried for years now, but it doesn't do me any justice. Yeah, it's um, kind of like bliss. Yeah. You know, where it's just like a... Uh, not a surreal experience, but it's um, it's something that's like you feel. It's a feeling more than anything. Um, yeah, and bliss is probably not the right word, but it points to, I think, that feeling. Mm. Uh, when you're able to like be at the highest level of the highest and quantifiably know that I played safety. There's only two starting safeties on a defense at a time, so... At most, or at, at least, there's 64 safeties in the world that are doing my job. Only 64 right. people. You're one of 64. One, and I'm one of 64, um, which is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll really put that into perspective. But I think it just that's an example of like the gravity of what it means to to be at that level. Um, and then, like when you get into stadium environments where like the crowd is roaring, the energy, the lights are on. I mean. It's it's magical, um, and, and uh, you know it's really really hard to kind of describe or put into words. But yeah, it's a, it's it's everything that you could possibly imagine and more. Yeah, I see you smiling and kind of going back to that place. It feels like a place of flow for you. You're performing you at your it. peak. You're performing at your peak level, and you're getting recognized, and you're motivated to work to keep getting better and better each time. You're both in your comfort zone and outside of it in a way that feels exciting and challenging for you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a, that's an even better way to put it. Uh, flow, uh, being in that state of flow. And a lot of times, particularly like when you're on the field, you know, again, you're in a stadium of 80,000 people. You don't hear anything because mm. you're so locked in on like the, the yeah. man and the team across from you. It's, again, a very surreal experience, um, but flow is a very, very accurate way to describe it. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer in, like, consciousness and have dedicated, like, a full-on study to the power of now. And yeah. so, like, there's a, there's a chapter in the book or a talking point in the book where it talks about, like, where you're just in a state of no mind, right? Like, mm. you're not thinking, but you're understanding, and you're just being. Right. Mm. And that's kind of, again, what flow kind of means. And it's interesting because in that environment, there are so many things that you need to calculate and understand each and every play. Personnel, mm -hmm. like who's in the game, uh, down in distance, where's the ball at? Uh, what's the score? What's the time on the clock? Who's across from me? What is our defensive call? What is my role? What is my responsibility? And that changes based off of a lot of, there's, I mean, there's so many Parameters. different variables that you're processing yeah. in 40 seconds. Uh, it is, yeah, it's, it's magical. It sounds exhilarating. I also, when you said it's a way to kind of get out of your mind, that almost felt so relaxing to me as a way where your body is completely working to its best and there's almost no time to think and you're just doing you're not and thinking, doing you're just going. it yep. well. Yep. And, it. and what, what does it take, Ryan, to get there for you? What got you there? It was this brutal honesty with yourself of your strengths and your weaknesses. What else? Uh, repetition, uh, consistency, uh, discipline, uh, and that all builds up to endurance. Uh, I talk about this a lot with my team. Uh, endurance requires two things. Uh, it requires exceptional work habits. Uh, and a lot of people talk about, like, you know, how to work, to grind, so on and so forth. 
But on the other side of the equation, you also need to take really good care of yourself as well. Um, because if you just work, 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 and you don't take care of yourself, you won't be working too much longer. And so just as much as Preach. you work, you have to recover. And, yeah. and uh, that's what endurance means to me. And that's ultimately why I was able to have uh, the career that I did. Like I was never, I was a very good player, but I was never, I wasn't an NFL pro, pro bowler. I was, I'm not a hall of famer or any of that type of stuff. Uh, but because I was self-aware of who I was, uh, what my skills were and how I could contribute value uh, to make sure that I extracted value and work my ass off and also took really good care of myself. I was able to play eight years in the NFL. Um, yeah. so, you know, it is, um, there's just so many lessons that I've learned from that experience and I'm really, really thankful for it. I will ask you toward the end what some of your tools are for your peak performance, but I want to talk about your relationship with the game. And I know that's part of how you got inspired to build alchemy. Yeah. Um, I love football. Um, and football has obviously been a, a massive part of my life. Um, I built my entire world yeah. around it. And at the age of 31, the music stopped. Um, and just to double click into like what that looks like to provide some context, I was 31 years old, I had back surgery. And so I was an injured reserve. Um, and then also to the uh, organization that I was with that final year, just it was not a good culture, uh, for, for me. And, uh, and so not only was I physically hurt, I was emotionally hurt and, uh, you know, when, when, you're, when, you're, when I was in that headspace, uh, I was dealing with like self doubt, uh, thinking about like, Hey, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I don't want to play football anymore. I literally had a thought, um, when I was sitting there watching a the game, um, it was a really hard hit that happened over the middle. And I was like, wow, that looks like it hurts. I never thought that before about football. Like, you know, like right. you see the ball, go hit it. Um, but my mindset, towards an approach towards the game was changing rapidly. And so uh, I walked away from football emotionally hurt and physically hurt. And I own that decision not to come back after my best year ever as a pro. Uh, so that's how hurt I was. That's how emotionally distraught I was. And, right. uh, but I, but what I did, I did not want to happen with somebody to tell me that I wasn't wanted. I always wanted to own that decision. Like, you're not going to tell me to leave. I'm leaving on my own terms. And I really think that drove uh, that decision back back then. Was it the right decision? I don't know, but it was the decision. And so- Can I pause you here, Ryan? Yeah. Because again, you said you left while you were at your peak. You decided to leave on your own terms, even though you were emotionally, physically hurt. Yep. Again, I'm hearing your strong sense of self. That's a tough decision to make. And I'm hearing you investing in yourself and committing to yourself. Yeah, so, I mean, I had to, um, even when I was just dealing with massive bouts of doubt. And I don't even know, to be honest with you, I don't even know if I was really aware or self-aware or even trusting myself. I just, again, I was so emotionally and physically hurt. I just knew I didn't want to do that. So that's the space that I was in. And so I don't even know if I would go off of the swing the pendulum in the other direction to say, like I had utmost confidence and trust in myself because I did it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was preparing, like I got an MBA while I was an active athlete. So I, and I knew I was smart and I could figure things out, but I didn't know what that looked like. So I was scared. Um, but I, I think it just really speaks to like how much I didn't want to do that, and be a part of that anymore. Yeah. You were scared, but you were brave in, in yeah, trying yeah, another for sure. path. For sure. Um, so I just wanted to like provide a little context there, um, which was a lot of context, but it talks no, about like great. the relationship that I had with football for the, like the next five years where I hated the game, didn't want to talk about it. I, I hardly watched football. Um, yeah, I just didn't want anything to do with it because I was trying to find myself beyond the game. And I knew that I didn't want to coach, didn't want to go on TV and talk about football. I just didn't want to be a part of it at all. And so, like, there was this very hard line that was drawn uh, for something that I had built my whole world around over the last 24 years. And I was disassociated from it uh, completely and also, like, psychologically, too. 
So that was hard for me to reconcile and kind of work through. Um, it's like you were figuring out who is Ryan outside of this whole identity, what's been literally his life for the past yeah, 10 plus years. But I don't even, again, looking back, like, that is Ryan. So why am I, why am I asking the question, who is Ryan, if that is Ryan? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so, like, again, it feels good. It's a long, long way of saying, like, I got away from the game. I was not a part of the game for a while. I'm getting back into it uh, pretty aggressively now. Uh, because again, I realize that that was that is me, right? So mm -hmm. why am I trying to separate myself from myself? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so, how did that lead you to alchemy? Yeah. So, again, everything that I had spoken to around that transition, like when I retired, I was trying to get help, uh, trying to talk to people, uh, get some support. It was a very bad experience. Uh, I ultimately got to a decent landing spot. Uh, but the lesson there for me was around, it wasn't about financial resources because I had money and I could, mm -hmm. you know, find the right way to, or find the right people to take care of my knee, my neck, my back or my shoulder. But when it came to my heart, my head, it was like crickets and I couldn't buy my way to help. And so, uh, I immediately realized that while financial resources are very, very important, they're not the end all be all, particularly for folks who look like me and, with that in mind, that experience in mind, and then also during this like period of like five years or so from 2015 to 2020, my family was just going through an onslaught of chronic disease awareness. I mean, my grandfather passed away from Alzheimer's. My father-in-law passed away at an early age from a heart attack. My grandmother had a stroke. I mean, there was a lot of things that were just happening. Um, and I professionally, I'm dealing with all this stuff on a personal side. Right. Uh, professionally, I was in the startup space um, you know, angel investing in their companies, just like running around in tech circles, et cetera. <laughs> and I knew I was like, look, you know, at some point I want to start a company. I want to, you know, like bring an idea to life and change the world. My first vision with that was a straw company in 2018 uh, called Swizzle. And uh, it was a cool business, but that wasn't the business. And we did well there. Uh, and I sold that company, but I sold it. I was, we were ready to sell the company because I was ready to do this. I knew mm -hmm. that this was a business just due to my experience, my family's experience, but it kind of took me a while to kind of for that light to come on. And I started to see like the healthcare space becoming very verticalized. There was platforms for men, there was platforms for women, there was platforms for the LGBTQ community, et cetera. And I didn't see no platform that was focused on me or folks who look like me. Yeah. And so with all that in mind, I was like, oh, that's it. And I like to, you know, <laughs> going after it and doing big things. And so I said, I'm going to bring this company to life. Yeah. And I was so excited learning about it. And I love this. You're going after being the healthcare platform for the Black community, providing universal healthcare for the Black community. Tell me about where you are today and then what your vision of where you want to go is. Yeah. Our mission is to create generational health and how that mm -hmm. shows up. Uh, visually is a world in which black health disparities are non-existent. I talk about Alzheimer's. I talked about diabetes, uh, amputation. I talk about heart attack, stroke, et cetera, obesity, mental health issues, so on and so forth. Across every chronic disease and illness, the black community is at an outsized risk factor, um, higher than other races and ethnicities in yeah. the country. And so we want to, we want to get rid of that. We want to stabilize that. Um, and that's how we show up uh, from a mission and vision standpoint. Our starting point is oriented around like mental health, mental fitness, mental wellness, health and wellness, et cetera, because we grounded ourselves in the core belief that a healthy life starts with a healthy mind. And so yeah. right now, we uh, create content products that show like mental health video courses, which we call Alchemy Labs. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are licensed clinical professionals who talk about subject matters uh, such as like uh, being black in the workplace, uh, generational trauma, so on and so forth. We also make meditations and mindfulness practices in the audio format. And then lastly, uh, we go live, uh, live stream on our platform uh, with the product called Holding Space. And basically, it's just like a Zoom conversation and group therapy setting. Uh, but we started with content because we knew that there was a bunch of access barriers as it relates to people you know, getting the help and support that they need. Stigma, people don't like to talk about it. Education, people don't know what to talk about. 
uh, search costs. People don't know where to look for the things that they uh, they don't know and they don't want to talk about. And then if you get over all those hurdles, and it's like, can I afford it? Financially, therapy is very, very expensive. Do I have time for it? Scheduling conflicts. Can I get to it? Is it 10, 15, 20 miles away? I mean, all these things right. get in the way of like people just getting started. And yeah. so that's why we started with content. I love that approach, by the way. And I'm also, one thing I'm grateful for with COVID is that things like therapy are now a little more accessible with video calls and conversations. Yep. And that can somewhat reduce the price point. Ryan, I'd love to talk about how we can support Black men today in the context of mental health care, right? I, I know that in the community, we've had so many losses recently. We had another terrible incident. At the end of last year, we had Twitch committed suicide. Um, and I know that you've shared a stat before about how in 2019, only about 9.8% of the Black community has seen a therapist versus 20-ish percent of white folks. How can we support Black men in particular? Well, first, I'd like to thank you for highlighting Black men. Um, you know, far too often that doesn't happen, and I think mm -hmm. contributes to a lot of things that we'll talk about right now. Um, you know, black men in particular, uh, a lot of times show up as like the unsung hero, uh, again, not fully acknowledged and or appreciated or just even taking a step back, just understood. Um, yeah. I think that's really the, the grounding there is like, are, is there, a, is there a disconnect? I believe there's a disconnect between the, uh, expectation and like, what we actually are right and i think in between what do you have you have the misunderstanding um, yeah and and very little i think has been done to like shorten that gap uh whether it's through conversation whether it's through products services health care inequities that gap is not being shortened so that's why you have all the health health statistics that i listed for black, um, black health out of all the races um ethnicities and genders, black men have the worst health statistics out of all. And, and so um, a lot of times we just kind of fly under the radar or our issues fly under the radar because what you see in the media is big, strong, fast, right? Yeah. Athlete or, you know, got money flashy, I'm okay, right? Or I don't care. Uh, those are the two like images that you see. And, and so, like, people don't necessarily uh, appreciate and or, again, like, what we go through as a whole collectively for the everyday Black man because the things that you see are not everyday, right? But yeah. there, a lot of Black men feel like they're being held to that expectation. And that's a disconnect from reality in and of itself, too. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that can, can further be discussed here. But ultimately, getting to a solution, I think it's more around, like, spaces, we need our own space. We need to have that safe space, excuse me, safe space to have the conversation um, with folks who are going through the same things that we're going through. Like, oh, you get me. You understand me, right? Like, I'm a dad. Um, I'm a husband. You know, all these things. Um, how did you deal with this? Or here's what I thought about. Or here's how I handle. Those, sp those spaces need to happen, and they need to happen explicitly for us. Um, so the solution, or at least getting started, isn't overly complicated. Because again, the space, um, you know, just needs to be created in, in, in those environments. You know, when you're on the same wavelength, guys will open up and go talk. Yeah. For me, I'd also say just seeing black men as human beings, because to your point, we've had this image of strong, fast, capable, or got it. Um, or unfortunately for fo some folks, it's like dangerous in the media. Yeah. Uh, and so just seeing them as, seeing you as a human being, also allowing you the space to let me know when you're not okay, because yeah. you are human, you're not always okay, you're not always perfect. Yeah. Um, and just from both sides, enabling you to feel like you can share fully, be fully open, ask for help and receive help. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all the above, right? Um, and that shows up in this space. So, yeah, I, I think it's time. I've already, I can't tell you the amount of conversations that I have with black men. I was literally on the phone for an hour this morning with one of my college buddies. 
um, you know, same setup, black right. dad, approaching 40, married, kids, the whole, like the life scenario. Right. And yeah, it's, it's just time. Uh, I'm yeah. 100% honest with you. It's time to have those spaces and those conversations uh, with intentionality because the realization is like, you want to be everything that you can be, achieve potential, whatever that means to you, and more. But there's, you realize that there's something outside of yourself that you need help and support with. Like, right. it's like this tension that you're kind of dealing with. Uh, like, look, I'm so close, but I feel so far away. And the only way that I'll get closer, or not even closer, but I'll truly unlock, is if like I find a community, a support, therapy, whatever it is. Is showing up a lot more and that's really exciting and i love seeing you creating the space with alchemy and also modeling that so thank yeah. you for doing that thank you i want to talk also about folks that are going through mental health challenges and may not feel like they can ask for help and i know again that alchemy is creating spaces for this and you've also you've talked about your journey what would you say to those folks in inviting them in uh -oh. I would say go at your own pace uh, and understand that, like, there is no end point. It's about yeah. the journey, right? And that goes back to our namesake, the alchemist. Um, so when you realize, like, instead of trying to do X, Y, and Z to get to a destination, but just rather, like, let me do X, Y, and Z and keep going or, like, just yeah. enjoy the journey along the way and be present each and every step and not take that step with an expectation to get to a destination. Um, but really appreciating that, I think is, that'll set you up, right? Because a lot of people enter into like health and wellness programs. I want to lose 15 pounds. And then when you lose 15 pounds, uh, there's two things that happen. You lose 15 pounds and you stop, right? Oh, I did it. Don't need to yeah. like maintain this lifestyle. Move it forward. That's not how it works. You know, like, yeah, exactly. Or if you don't hit it, then you're like, oh, man, I don't hit it. And then, you know, all the negativity starts. Yeah. Happening. So, like, really just kind of being present and enjoying each step of the way and thinking about progress as opposed to destination. Uh, I think it's a really, really important level set for folks who are just looking to, like, get on the path. Because if you, you try to take it all on and say, like, look, I want to do this. Half the time, I don't even know what you're talking about. You don't even know why that is a goal for you because you don't have that much exposure or experience with it. So just kind of, like, ease into it, understand like, look, this is going to be a process. I'm here to learn and I'm receiving it all. Love it. I love also what you just said. Half the time you have a goal, you don't even know why this is a goal. Why'd you and make so, that up? Yeah. Right. Uh, where, where did that number come from? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> where did that number come from? Like, you, you're, the ex you're the exercise or the wellness expert setting your own goal and you just got here. You know, like, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I also encourage people to take things off their to-do list that don't need, why is this on your to-do list? Yeah. Um, but along these lines, something that really, that I watched recently that really moved me that I want to recommend is there's this, it's based off of a book. Now it's a movie on Apple TV. It's called The Boy, The Mole, The Fox, and The Horse. Oh. And it's a, just a 35 minute animation about the journey. And it's for folks of all ages and such a beautiful just capture and capture of what you just described. I'll, um, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Given this journey, I'd love to come back to talking about you, Ryan. What does strength mean to you? To me, strength means confidence and trust in myself. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the self. The sense yeah. of self and investing in oneself. Tell yeah, me more. but specifically calling out like confidence and, and trust. And mm -hmm. where I'm going with it is just like minimizing and hopefully eliminating all negative self-talk, right? Like we're all guilty of it at some point, uh, but I'm, I'm really moving towards uh, a place of like prioritizing inner strength. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a big, big one for me around like minimizing the uh, the negative uh, self-talk, which is like full circle moment when you talk about like the negative self-talk or thinking. So I'm really trying to get to a place of like presence and consciousness because like when you think you're not present or conscious or in the now, 
when you think, you're thinking about the past or the future. Neither one of them is right now. Right. Funny thing is, like, particularly when you think about the future, whatever you're thinking about in the future will happen in the now. And so, like, just kind of level setting and taking a step back and saying, uh, more times than not, when I think I'm thinking about the past, that can, in some ways, uh, exuberate depression, right? Mm-hmm. Thinking about old things that I don't have anymore that I miss. And then thinking about future state, um, you know, yeah. that, that can bring on anxiety, worry. Right. Oh, I don't know how this thing is going to go. Or like, I'm worried about X and it ain't happened yet. And so really just trying to get to a place of like uh, solidified inner confidence and trust in myself. What's been helpful for you in getting there? Um, they should be paying me for as much as I talk about this book. <laughs> but the book has been super <laughs> The book has been super helpful, um, and I listen to it all the time, <laughs> quite literally all the time. Um, that's been helpful. Uh, practically, just making sure that I'm owning my schedule has been really, really helpful for me. Uh, like, if you were to look at my calendar, you would see focus time. You would see this is what I'm working out. You would see uh, this is what I'm taking a break, but I'm not doing anything. Like I literally schedule break time within my work day so that like whatever is on my schedule, I don't have to like be all over the place. I'm going to just do whatever's on my schedule. So that's yeah. been re- really, really helpful for me. Working out uh, and being a lot more intentional about that has been super helpful for me too. Um, and then the last bucket is hydration. Yeah, I just drink a ton of water. Now. How you perform at your best and especially as an athlete, as an entrepreneur, What's in your toolkit? Hearing hydration, owning your schedule, working out. What can listeners steal from you? Yes, definitely those three things. Um, again, double clicking in it, owning my schedule is like either my time's going to run me or I'm going to run my time. Uh, and as CEO of a company, like there's no shortage of things that I can be doing and I could be pulled in a bunch of different directions. And I'm a dad and I'm a husband, right? So like, I got a whole life outside of work. Um, yeah. So like I have to really, really make sure that uh, my schedule is tight. So I would definitely say that. Um, and, and I think just this approach is practical to whatever it may mean to you. But just really prioritizing, uh, I call it the personal user journey. Right? Like everybody in tech talks about like the user journey and like the customer journey. Well, what is your yeah. What is your personal journey throughout your day, right? Yeah. How does that go? Um, yeah. Talked about scheduling, but more so from a, that's from a, like a functional standpoint. What I'm talking about is quality. Like, do you have quality touch points with everything that you're doing throughout your day? So from the time that you wake up to the time that you go to sleep, what was the quality of life for you that day, right? Um, I'm a big, big proponent of that. So like just thinking about the small things that I could do throughout my day whether that's taking, you know, some more water or like, uh, I don't know, starting my car before actually getting it, you know, just like really simple yeah. things like that, that can like make or break or an opportunity to like send my mood south. I try to send it the other way. Uh, so like really yeah. just finding those opportunities to take good care of myself all across the board. I am a strong believer that we fall to the level of our processes. So it's all about the systems we put in place for ourselves. Yeah. And you may like, I'm also nerd. If it's not on my calendar, it's not going to happen. And if I don't hit it a hundred percent, that's also fine. You don't beat yourself up. But like, if you can get to it 80% of the time, that's beautiful. Yeah. Ryan, what does success mean to you these days? Being fulfilled. What does that mean to you? Uh, Waking up with joy and pleasantness every day. You're so, you're beaming right now. I I feel like you're very fulfilled. You're beaming. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm just trying to be happy and healthy, really. That's what success looks like for me. Uh, you know, it's not a monetary value. There's there's no amount of money that I think, uh, yeah. you know, how can you, that's a highly arbitrary number, right? Is it 50 million? Is it 100 million? Well, what are you doing with, you know, uh, 100 million that you can't do with 50 million? There's always an incremental dollar out there. Yeah. So um, success looks like, to me, just like happiness, not even happiness, excuse me, peace, because happiness depends on positive outcomes, peace, you're good, mm-hmm. positive or negative. Uh, so I would say peace and health. That's what success looks like for me. Beautiful.
And what is home to you? It's my family. Um, I really understand the difference. You ever hear like those old R&B songs, like a house is not a home and stuff like that? Yes. Oh, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> um, but I get it now. Um, yeah. I have an amazing wife. I have two daughters. I have a dog, right? Like, you know, Aww. it's a feeling. Home's a feeling, not necessarily a destination uh, or a physical location. And um, to me, home represents my family. Same. I've been traveling around my whole life and home is with the people I love. Yeah. What is your why? It's a great question. What is my why for life? It could also be for this moment, whatever is coming to you for life. Yeah. I just know like I'm capable of a lot. Mm -hmm. I am, I've been very, very blessed throughout my life uh, with my experiences and just, I know I can do a lot. And so I try to do a lot and not in the service of me. Um, but let me say it like this, not in the exclusive service of me, right? Like I work very hard and, and uh, I would like to have like personal success for myself and my family, but the driver has always been like, I've been blessed with a lot. So like, how can I use that to help people? Uh, yeah. I, Cause I know I can get in the door. I know I can do it. I'm not necessarily concerned with myself, but like, how do I help other people? Right. Cause yeah. I understand what I represent. What I'm Beautiful. And then my last question, what impact do you hope to have? I just want to inspire, inspire change, inspire growth. Uh, yeah. Anytime that you leave a conversation with Ryan Money, you should just feel inspired. I feel inspired. I feel like I can go do what it is that I want to do and the impact that I want to make. What? Ryan, you are so capable. I really, really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you for coming on. And everyone should check out Alchemy. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation as well. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave a review and share.